This is a legacy episode of the Lesbian Historic Motif podcast, originally released as part of the Lesbian Talk Show podcast group. Some references may be obsolete. The show looks at lesbian-relevant themes in history and literature, has interviews and discussions about current historical fiction with queer female characters, including fantastic versions of the past, and presents new original historical fiction for your enjoyment. Today, the Lesbian Historic Motif Project is talking to Molly Tanser, who has written a number of books that place queer characters in historic settings and then throw fantastic antagonists at them. Welcome, Molly. Oh, thank you very much. Molly, you've written across a number of genres, always with an overlay of the weird. But of course, given my podcast topic, I'd like to talk about the works where you intersected queer female characters with historic settings. And the book that drove me to work up the guts to invite you on the show is Creatures of Will and Temper. So perhaps you could tell our listeners a bit about it, and of course, about the recently released sequel, Creatures of Want and Ruin. I would be delighted. Um, Creatures of Will and Temper is an historical novel um, that does have a fantastical element, but it's um, it's based on um, picture of Dorian Gray. And so um, there was already a bit of, histo- of fantastical nature to that story as well, but I think I definitely ratcheted it up because the, um, demons are real in the conceit <laughs> of this uh, retelling. And also, but the, the main thing I f- had a really good time doing with it was um, in gender inverting most of the characters. Uh, some of the the queer themes of um, Dorian Gray actually caused like a lot of uh, scandal when it was initially published. And so the version that most of us read in school is a much less queer version than he originally wrote. A lot of the uh, homoerotic eros that was going on was cut from later editions, especially as regards um, Basil and his relationship with Dorian. But I decided that I wanted to amplify that. And since I tend to write about women's and women's experience, I I wanted to continue the queerness of the book, um, but then turn it around and write about women's experience. So it was really interesting. Um, I have a, my master is focused on 18th century British literature, but I sort of strayed into the Victorian a few times um, just because it was easy to get courses in that regard. So I already had a very good grounding in Victorian literature. And um, it's interesting, my, my favorite class about Victorian literature was one that I took called Desire and Disease in Victorian London. Ooh. And that one, it was really an amazing class. And it's interesting that since lesbianism was pathologized at that time, um, there were a lot of queer, a lot of queer elements to a lot of the women's fiction that was going on about desire and disease. So I, I, I had a lot of research under my belt with that to begin with, even if it was a lot of <clears throat> underground discussions, right? It wasn't right out there in the forefront like mine is, where Dorina is a little bit anachronistic in that she's just like, I'm a lesbian, it's so fantastic. <laughs> This is a fantasy book. Demons exist. I'm just going to, I'm going to go for this. Okay. Um, so that that was a little bit of that there. But I do tend to explore queer themes in my fiction just because I do think there's a lot of queer erasure in historical fiction. And while you have certain authors that are doing a lot in that regard, um, like I wanted to be among their number of people who are representing history as a, a lot closer as it would have been than the more sanitized narratives that we've gotten over time that tend to elide the very real presence of queer people in our history, literary and artistic and otherwise. Mm -hmm. So I love, you touched on this just now, but I love how the book catches the spirit of the decadent and aesthetic movements. Yeah, it's a passion of mine. And and as you mentioned, queer sexuality is sort of an embedded aspect of both of those themes. And did you have particular challenges in putting your characters into that context and how they approach their own identities and sexuality. You mentioned that Dorina is a bit more self-aware of her queerness than one might expect for the day. I'm not sure that's true, although perhaps for a a young middle-class girl. Well, I think, um, I just mean in terms of her enthusiastic embracing of it, especially being from like an upper middle class place, I think that she's a little bit... um, bolder than your normal like country country minor noble would be (laughs) about such things um just because i I read a i read a couple of things when i was first starting out as a writer about like what kind of stories do queer people get Uh and i read a lot about like the um 
the kill your gays problem of mm-hmm. like the tragic the tragic lesbian who dies or the tragic gay man who dies and I've tried every time I've engaged with queerness to avoid things like I mean people die in books that's just yeah. something that happens but you can fall in and out of that stereotype and so with Darina I really wanted to have her be the character who was most comfortable with her sexuality among everyone I didn't want it to be her discovering she was a lesbian I wanted it to be her start with her knowing that she preferred women and that this was part of her identity and that she was allowed to feel these feelings and that they were valid and then her straight laced straight sister was the one who was wrestling with her sexuality the entire time because I felt that that would be a fun narrative and the dynamic of that would be a lot um, more interesting for me as a writer. Um, there are a lot of queer coming of age stories out there in both adult historical fiction, which is what I write, and in YA. And so rather than tread that path again, it seemed kind of fun to have her be like, nah, I just like chicks. Like, what's your problem, <laughs> sister? Like, just like grow up before I throw up. And so, like, I. I wanted her to be in that place, which um, I tend to have a, a few like verbal anachronisms and stuff like that in my writing just to keep it sounding as modern as it would have sounded to people mm-hmm. in that time period. So that's what I mean about having her be anachronistic. I, it was defi- It's not anachronistic for her to be aware of these things, but rather her attitude towards it is this bold, brash sort of like, take me and leave me, Victorian England. And it's like, oh. Yeah. <laughs> one of the Maybe. things I loved was that in many ways the sister and I'm currently totally blanking on the sister's name what was she oh, hmm? oh Evadne Evadne. right so I'm one of the things I loved is that the sister Evadne is in some ways the more butch character you know yes. she is the uh the nerdy scholarly fencer she you know she dresses up in pants to go to fencing school and uh, very no nonsense with in terms of relationships with men. Although you know she, she she's not entirely certain what she wants no. in that terms, and and reading the book jacket cover copy, I I kept thinking it's like oh man, Evadne's being set up to be the queer character, except except it very clearly says that she's falling in love with a man. Oh oh no no no, uh, and and I'm gonna confess it took me. A couple of years to get around to reading the book because I read that cover copy and I felt like I was being queer baited. It's like it, it, it feels queer around the edges, but it, 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 what does it feel like to have your book's publicity bury the lead like that? Well, you know, it's funny. I'm trying to remember. I think I wrote a lot of this cover copy um, and I, I tried to, so I'm looking at it now, and it, um, it Yeah, it, it, it says that Dorina is enamored of Lady Harriet. Yeah, she is enamored of her, and... Uh, um, enamored and is kind of a weak word. It is, but at the same time, like, uh, so I, it's funny, people don't necessarily realize how um, writers are responsible for writing a lot of their own publicity materials. Oh, and yes, I, I so am aware. The, <laughs> Yeah, the, the book jacket copy, I was definitely asked to contribute to it, and I didn't I didn't mind that at all. It was interesting to me, because I get super uptight about back cover copy. I never want, I never know what to reveal and what to redact, because people are so, people are so concerned with spoilers in yes. this day and age. And I had I somebody, because... I had one author tell me that, well, no, I didn't make it clear that the protagonist is in a same-sex relationship because that would be a spoiler it's like yeah yeah. you know it's weird what people are going to get upset about I know that I and I'm super gun shy about it too because I when I was um starting to explore reading the works of H.P. Lovecraft I picked up an old edition that had um the uh the shadow over Innsmouth in it and I read the back cover copy and it was like and he finds out and then just reveals the whole ending of the mystery and I was like who wrote this like why would you do this this is like this is a I mean just because this was written in the 20s doesn't mean that people are going aren't going to come to it for the first time in the future so to me I have to think about that too where it's like you know what will people want to know and so I I I tried to I tried to make it a little bit about that but it's difficult too when you're writing. All three of the books in the series have protagonists. That's the cool yeah. new word that people are using. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, I wanted to give them equal time, but but Evadne really does sort of come to the forefront of the book in a few ways, just because mm-hmm. she does more protagonisting than Dorina does. So I yeah. did focus it on her, but you know now I'm questioning myself because now that I'm looking over it, I uh, 
I didn't I didn't want to give away that they would eventually get together because that does sort of feel like I mean it happens so late in the book sorry everyone will say this <laughs> but they do have a relationship um you know I never know I never know that kind of thing and I I'm I'm kind of horrified to hear that it was interpreted as queer baby because that's definitely what it's my least my my, my the something I I wanted to do the least um and that's why I kind of foregrounded the queerness of it in the um, author's note that I that I put in the front of it um because yeah it is it's it is annoying to be queer baited and it's it's a huge problem that I dislike in television and things like that. But no, like Darina was always going to be just like a hardcore, like never even kissed a boy to know who she was kind of character. <laughs> Whereas Lady Henry is a little bit like, I guess I tried, but I don't know. Like, ugh, gross. Like, <laughs> so yeah, I don't know. Like it was, it was fun to write them both. Uh-huh. Um, so. I'm glad. Yeah, that. and and uh, I apologize for using the word queer baiting because that isn't actually what I meant. It was more. There's this phenomenon I've seen, especially from the mainstream publishers. And keep in mind that my own books are being published by a lesbian press, so I, mine fall under the category of you have come to a donut shop, you are going to buy donuts, we are going to sell you donuts, sure. and. What I find often with the mainstream press is you look at a book, a book that has, say, been submitted for consideration by the Lambda Literary Awards, and you read the cover copy, and it's like, well, why? I mean, what, what, why? That's fair. And, yeah. and, and it was more like that. It was, it was, if I didn't have a, if I hadn't read Vermilion, oh, sure. I would not have, it would not have occurred to me that the book might have queer characters. But, mm-hmm. I, but let's move on from that. So I loved your debut novel, Vermilion. Oh, thank you very much. And uh, it came out back in 2015. And for my <laughs> listeners, it, this is, I would describe it as a weird Western. It has supernatural yeah. beings like vampires and Sasquatches. It's also a world populated with sentient non-human species based on like bears and sea lions. <laughs> and it has got queer rep all over the place. Um, the protagonist, Lou Merriweather, is biracial. She is British and Chinese and operating out of San Francisco as a psychopomp, someone who lays the spirits of the dead to rest. And she is embodying a really popular trope in Westerns with female protagonists that she is a woman wearing masculine clothing and sometimes being read as male and that's okay with her. And I hope that I am being accurate in um, reading her as female dressed in men's clothes as opposed to perhaps more on the genderqueer spectrum. You know, it's interesting. I I wrote the first... So Vermilion did come out in 2015, but I wrote the very first draft of it in 2010. And I wanted at that time... When we just had... Um, and, I, and I mentioned that sort of time gap now in 2019 because things have changed so much in oh, terms yeah. of the way that we discuss identity even in that almost decade period yeah and I'm not sure if I necessarily had a just to be completely honest I'm not sure if I had a handle on the language that I do now which I still don't think is as is exceptional I still learn things all the time um but I wanted her to I I do refer to her as a her I've always thought of her as someone who um, didn't I mean the language that people had at that time period was a lot different as well even even more substantially more different than just between 2010 and 2019 the way that people talked about gender and and sexuality in 1870 was remarkably different yes. but I never really had her questioning her identity as um as a woman but rather I had she's just sort of existing in a lot of in-between spaces yes and that was clear she's a little too busy to figure out exactly how she would want to be considered. Like I've had people ask if she's trans and I've never considered Lou to be trans. She always, to me, felt like a, like a, a like that she was comfortable in her body and it was just other people that had issues with it. Mm-hmm. Um, and not that trans people aren't comfortable in it, but that's not. Yeah, no, I'm no, I, I yes, yeah, but I think I understand. I'm trying to get across something here that I'm not sure if I'm articulating it very well, but uh, she is not sure about a lot of things, including even her sexuality um, because she's been asked to choose a lot of things her whole life and she is someone who is not into choosing. Uh-huh. And and it comes across very clearly as I recall that yeah. she is attracted to multiple genders and is okay. sorting that out and at the end of the book there's a sense that there might be a relationship with a woman in her future um and with a specific woman in the book it, it, it but it's still something she's thinking about. 
Uh, did you ever yeah. think about writing further beyond the end of that book and exploring that question? I did. I uh, There were going to be sequels that unfortunately never materialized for uh, various different reasons. And now, you know, it's funny, It's it, Vermilion is my most popular book. I still get people emailing me about it and asking about sequels, and I'm super grateful. But it's interesting to me because I... I would love to go back and work on it again, but again, in the 10 years that have been since I even came up with Blue's character, the I'm not sure if I'm in the same place that I was when I wrote that. Like when I was when I was writing Vermilion, I was heavily involved with the um, Asian American community out here in Colorado. I was doing um, traditional kung fu in a studio that um, every Lunar New Year would serve the Chinese and Vietnamese community around here doing lion dance. And I was doing lion dance at the time. I was in the tail of the lion and we would like do tricks and routines and things like that. And because of that, I felt like I was a little bit more able to write in that mode. And now that that has gone from my life, I think I, I and now that the own voices movement has sort of influenced me and made me realize a few things about, you know, I don't think that I, I was trying, I tried really hard not to be culturally appropriative of Vermilion, and I, I'm, and I, I'm not afraid to go back to that space, I just know that the amount of um, buy-in I'd have to put in to make sure that I was still as up on everything I would need to be up on, I'm not sure that that's still in my life now that I'm not involved with that community. Yeah, I, 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 no, that makes total sense. I have to say that <laughs> reading it as a a white person, but a person who has read up on the history of you know the Chinese presence in the West historically, I would not have been surprised to discover that you had some Chinese heritage yourself. But I totally understand that coming from the place where you are, you might decide it's it's not as as the kids say these days, it's not your lane. Uh, yes, uh, it, it's fraught now. I mean, it was fraught then, and I don't think I realized how fraught it was, and I just went ahead with it because I was a lot younger and a lot brasher, and I was just like, you know what, I'm, I, I can do this. Like, I'm in, I I hang out constantly. Like, I'm, I'm listening. I'm trying to incorporate all of that. I had a huge reading list that I, I really looked into. I even actually paid a visit to San Francisco to visit the Chinese Historical Society out there and, um, and do all my due diligence and... Um, you know, I really, I do miss Lou and I, and, and a lot of the other characters and, and indeed I was going to bring out, um, her, so her partner, um, Wilhelm has a cousin named, Im has a nephew named Imri who's mentioned in the books and he was going to become a, a character later in it and a ton, a, just a lot of different things like that. And, and, as, and I'm not saying it'll never happen. There may be a point in time where I'm ready to go back to that world and explore it because I, I do love it, and it's I, Vermilion is the book I wrote when I first moved to Colorado and became so inspired by all the hiking I was doing and the landscape out here and and the history and things. And so I and since I'm still here and I now even live in a smaller, more rural city than I did <laughs> when I wrote it, um, it's really it's it's a it's a passion project, and I, I hope to go back to it. But we're just going to have to see where everything takes me at this point because it's. The world has changed in such a way that I know I would have to be even more careful. And I was so careful that I, I annoyed a few people making a lot of phone calls and ask and calling in favors, asking for translations of things and like hoisanis and things like that. So we'll see. Yeah. Um, I totally do, fair. Totally fair. I do love it very much, though. <laughs> yeah. Are there any historic eras that you'd love to set stories in that you haven't explored yet? It sounds like you've got a lot of projects in your head. I do. Um, the one I'm working on currently is set in the 1940s at the, at the tail end of World War II in England. And that's been really interesting because I've never worked in that time period before. Um, I, I I do long to go back to the 18th century. The 18th century is my area of, if I have an area of expertise, that is my area of expertise. It was the focus of my master's degree. I've read broadly in that time period. And I've said a few things there. Um, my uh, I have a novella called Rambolian that is sadly um, going out of print, uh, possibly before this podcast even airs, so that's going to be difficult for anyone to get their hands on, but it's a 18th century, um, uh, what would you call it? I guess I described it as Rashomon with fops. It's also got a little <laughs> quick content in it, but it's, a, it's about a fancy party where the Count of Saint-Germain shows up. And uh, everyone has a different experience of what happened at the party. And afterwards, because things go so badly, 
that the, the, the protagonist decides to try to piece together what everyone's experience of that night was, and he can't quite get a full grasp of it. Um, it's, it's a fun one. And I, and I have an 18th century novel as well called The Pleasure Merchant. That was my second published novel. That's all about a wig, a wig maker's apprentice who, um, is dismissed from his apprenticeship after he's blamed for a crime he didn't commit. And then he, it's the only novel I've written, long term thing I've written with a, a, the male, uh, protagonist. He, he basically becomes the valet of the man he suspects set him up, uh, for this crime. And it gets a very, it gets very very weird from there uh, <laughs> because he because it's a picaresque right so as he as he rises in society his his impulses become a lot lower and when he is offered his heart's desire for a price um, it's not the heart's desire that he starts out the book with but there's also a there's a secondary a protagonist in that one as well who is a um, a mysterious bisexual woman who is ha- hovering at the edges of this narrative, and she was really, really fun to write as well. So I'd love to go back to the 18th century just because I'm very comfortable there all the time, and I really enjoy that time period with its strange gender fluidity and oh, yeah. its um, its excesses and its sexiness and it's just re- like all on ridiculousness. And so I, I, I would love to go back to that at some point, but I, I actually think the next project I work on might just be pure fantasy. So we'll see. That's where I got my, <laughs> that's where I grew up. What I grew up reading. My dad was a huge reader of fantasy fiction and I've never written like a full on fantasy novel. And so we'll see if I go there first, I might chicken out and go back to writing historical fiction. So we'll see. <laughs> yeah. So you've, I think you've mentioned that your academic background is in historic literature. Mm-hmm. Uh, it and, is. and is that so do you have other historic interests outside of literature that led you into this or is it pretty much that that was your window into writing historical fiction it was a bit of my window into writing it although my my uh, undergraduate degree is in art history so it's funny I have a I have a pretty big historical background but it's all through art and literature I am so dreadful when it comes to dates and kings and monarchies and things like that because I I tend to think about things in terms of artistic movements rather than other ways of marking time. And so it's strange to think about, but I always have to like double, and it's like, is that the Victorian? No, it is. Okay, that is Victorian. Because what I'm (laughs) thinking about is what were people writing and painting at that time? And those markers are how history passes in in my understanding of it. So, But I think for uh, for a creative person, that might be a better way in because you're trying to create that that sense that feeling that you that that matches up very well with the literature and the aesthetics and the visuals you can always look up dates and names but getting getting the aesthetic is harder and that's that's really where my passion is like i've always been a bit of a mimic i really enjoy pastiche i've always really enjoyed pastiche i love the I love the way that people attempt to imitate the people that they respect and admire or that they are totally harshing on. Um, I, that conversation that people have through art, um, through imitation, is one of the things that fascinates me the most. And that's why often those, um, not to get like too hoity-toity about it, but... The oh, please, that please do. <laughs> oh, well, well you know, just, uh, the things that... I think the motifs that I tend to work with throughout... The through line of my work would be like doubling imitation, um, uh, uh, issues of identity, like who's pretending to be what in this scenario and how and why, and what are the emotional ley lines of this, you know, of this scenario. And I think, and I think my passion for art and the idea of like, even just like the Atelier where like you have people that are producing art in the style of X in order to please consumers just fascinates me. Like when we have these paintings and it's like, did this guy paint this? I don't know. Maybe it was just a studio. Like it's hard to tell. And I find that amazing that, and that, and, and also our obsession with the idea of authenticity, um, it's fascinating to me. So that tends to come through in my work, especially when I'm working in historical settings. I'm fascinated by the idea of literature being in conversation. So whether it's in conversation with its historic antecedents, or especially the ways in which different parts of genre literature are in conversation with each other, and especially working in the SFF, where 
it's in conversation with so many different genres currently. And, you know, you're doing the fantasy and it interacts with the Westerns and it interacts with weirdness and it interacts with, you know, queer literature and it interacts with the historic literature you're basing it on. And I, I'm utterly fascinated by all of that and the ways in which authors are bouncing off of each other, both for creativity and for evolution of thinking, the ways in which historical romance has been evolving to merge the the historic settings and the modern sensibilities. So, so I will never stop somebody from talking about that sort of thing in, in literature. I love it. I remember when I was just starting off in my master's and we were talking about 18th century literature. And um, it's funny, like I've never... I've never read, I've read most of Pamela, um, and I have never read Clarissa. And when people talk about 18th century literature, a lot, aside from Robinson Crusoe, those are like the three novels that people talk about, and they're all written by men. And yet those novels are in conversation with women's literature. I, I still maintain that women invented the, the novel, the modern novel as we conceptualize it today in 18th century England. Um, women's fiction at that time was highly based around the idea of an individual person's growth and change throughout a storyline. And and I know that's like a contentious topic and I'm not trying to take away from early novel contenders such as Don Quixote or Murasaki Shikabu's Tale of Genji. I just think that those things, we have this weird tendency to think that the novel is the most important form of literature, which I think is extremely modern of us. And I don't see it that way. I think <laughs> there are many different forms of literature and they all have equal importance and i also would maintain that many things that we call novels are actually romances in that in that uh -huh. sense of like this is a story about a thing but it's not necessarily focused on growth and change but really women are the people who are, are the writers who are focusing on that idea of how is this person different at the end of the story than they are at the beginning not socially but emotionally like how are they how have their thoughts and sensations and their feelings changed and so when we look at something like Pamela, and then when, um, and then at the 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 parody novel that came out, Shamala, and this whole 18th century conversation, or, or that 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 many men were having, you know, that the foundation of that really is women talking to one another through novels, because that's who was that they, they were who were reading novels, and men would pick them up and read them and get super into them, but these were. A, a lot of early 18th century novels were by women for women for women's consumption. And they often dealt with things such as slavery and the slave trade or women's subjectivity or women's experience in society and how it was unfair. And so, um, I don't know, I guess in, in, in the way that I try to have conversations in my novels with other forms of art and other and other writers, I, I see myself as going as, as it being sort of part of a tradition that goes back hundreds and hundreds of years that I get to be a part of. And it's, it's such a an honor and a privilege to have be part of that line. So I get super nerdy about it. <laughs> <laughs> that is fabulous. So <laughs> what are you working on currently that you want to tell the listeners about? I know you mentioned when we were chatting before we started recording about having a deadline coming up. So what's mm -hmm. that project? So yeah, I'm writing, so The Creatures of Will and Temper is the first in a series. The second is Creatures of Want and Ruin, which is also about two women. Um, and it is set in 19, on, in 1927 on Long Island in uh, in New York, which is where I'm from the South, but all my family is from Long Island. And I set it during there, during Prohibition, because I thought it would be an interesting historical setting. And it was, because it is a much more political novel than Creatures of Will and Temper, uh, in that I started it in the summer of 2016, <laughs> in my, my pre-writing in the summer of 2016, and I began to write in earnest and. I started writing it in the summer of 2016, and I, in terms of the pre-writing and the idea of it, and I started writing in earnest in November of 2016, which a few things were happening in this country during that time period, and it is a story about a young woman who's, um, and, and Long Island in the 20s, let me start there, Long Island in the 20s was an incredibly fraught time that was it's an interest. It was an interesting place to set a novel that is about modern concerns in a in a time period like that because they were going through a cultural shift as well. We tend to, especially being from the South, people in the South, and I think Americans who rely on American narratives of what happened in history tend to think of the North as being more enlightened when it comes to race and race relations post Civil War. But that is dubiously the case. And you know, we think of New York as being extremely cosmopolitan, but 
in the 30s, not long after this book is set, like one in eight people on Long Island had clan affiliation. And sure, that affiliation at that time was more concerned with, are you Catholic? <laughs> than necessarily like race, but race did play a part of it. And there was this concern about immigration that is obviously our huge national conversation right now. So yeah. it is a book about the idea of immigration and like the idea of community and who decides who gets to be a part of a community and who gives them that authority. And the young woman at the heart of that book, the two women are both trying to determine their own communities. But the, the, if, if, the, if Evadne has a, as an analog and sort of pulling to the forefront of creatures of will and temper, Ellie West, who is um, a bootlegger and Bay woman and is loosely based on my grandmother. Um, she sort of pulls to the front as well. And her father has become involved with a, church that seems more political than religious and it makes things difficult for her in her life and so there's that's the second book in the series and the third goes back to england and that's the one i'm finishing up right now it's called creatures of charm and hunger it will be out in the spring of 2020 and it is set at the tail end of world war ii and two young women they're younger than the other two books um they're just teens um just both of them are turning 16 basically uh they are both wrestling with a lot of what comes with being an, er an early teenager and also the end of the war one girl is a jewish refugee from germany who escaped the war to live apart from her parents in the north of england with a family friend and so she's got a lot going on and then the other woman jane is has failed an important test in her life and is not sure what that means for the rest of her life. So both of them are struggling with, again, a themes of identity. Who am I? What is my place in the world? And the queer themes in that one are a little less than the other books, although I am writing Jane as ace. And that has been an interesting challenge for me because I do tend to include a lot of sex and eros in my books. And Jane's feelings in that regard are remarkably different so it's been fun to read a lot of information about people who identify as ace and try to use that as a basis for um some meaningful representation in this book mm -hmm. so that has been like a apart from all of the other things that are going on in that that has been like really interesting for me yeah i i, I can see that from the other side um as an asexual yeah. myself trying to write characters who resonate with allosexual readers is yeah. a fascinating challenge. It is. It's, it's, it is. And I, and I, again, like we were talking about the own voices movement and things like that, but it's as someone who I, I, I do find it, it, it's, I do think we have to try to, as writers get outside of our own heads. Absolutely. And it's challenging in so many different ways, but I do find it rewarding in that I always think that I come to understand my friends with different identities a lot more when I'm listening to them in an effort to understand them enough that I could put something similar into something I'm writing, if mm -hmm. that makes sense. You yeah. know, whether it's history or whether it's identity and modernity, we all have such amazing experiences and it's an honor as a writer to try to get to encapsulate that as if through words, you know, I don't know. That's, Absolutely. It's, yeah. Any idea what you're going to work on once this manuscript is turned in? Or is that totally an open book, as it were? Um, it's So I, I have a goal this year of, of writing five short stories. I've already written two, which I'm shocked by because I'm not... I have to really make myself write short stories. Novels, I always have a novel sort of running as a background pro program in the back of my mind. Short stories, I have to concentrate on as much more because I'm not comfortable with them. But I, I let it slide last year. And I'm trying, I'm trying to be better about focus. I think many of us have had a lot of distractions in our lives since 2016. <laughs> and yeah, there's a reason I, why I went two years without a new book out. <laughs> yeah, it's so hard. And I think, I think many, many writers are going through the same thing, which is that, you know, our craft is necessarily solitary. And it is often done, um, I think, for many of us in a in a medium such as a computer that is extremely easy to then switch over to the internet. Yes. And as things are chaotic constantly, it's so easy to get lost in up to the minute politics. And you know, I have an app on my laptop and my phone called Self Control that locks me out <laughs> of social media sites. 
And it's it's a wonder it's a wonderful app, and because you can either create a blacklist or a whitelist. Like you can go to every website except for a few, or you can go to no websites except for a few um, that you determine. And that's been very helpful because as someone, you know, I volunteered on a political campaign in last year, which is one of the reasons that, you know, I was a little bit behind on on this novel because it was like, no, I have to advocate for this man who I think should be governor as opposed to like literal villain from an old Western Walker Stapleton. And it's like, <laughs> Jared Polis is like, I mean, have you ever heard a name that sounded more like, like, oh, Sheriff Walker Stapleton is going to shoot you dead. Like I've never heard anyone with a name like that before. And, and he was running against Jared Polis who, you know, is our, was our rep and in Boulder County. And, you know, he has his concerns, but he's, he's the first openly gay governor of, of a state. And, you know, he's a dad of two and he's Jewish as well. And, and I was super into him and I, I volunteered for him and, but it's, it's all, all of it is distraction away from getting your fingers on the keyboard and writing things down. And so I think so many of us have had that trouble and it, I'm hoping I'm, I'm, I don't know. I, I don't even know what I'm hoping for anymore. Uh-huh. Never. Yeah. I'm not even going to say that. What if, what are, what are we all hoping for in 2019? Just like for people to to just be become, I don't I don't even know. That's it's too much for this for this podcast. Yeah. So, uh, if people wanted to follow you on social media, where should they look for you? I am on most social media. I tend to keep my Facebook a little bit more private, and so I am Molly Tanzer on Facebook. If anyone here is down for more of this kind of rambling discourse, uh, find me there. I often will be, I try to, I accept most women's friend requests. I, I, I'm a little bit more cautious with men um, in this day and age, but if you send me a message before, uh, if you send me a message along with the friend request, I almost always accept those because it's like, okay, you're not a creeper. This is great. <laughs> uh, my Twitter is public and that's at molly underscore the underscore tans so molly the tans and then my instagram is just my name as well molly tanzer and that is also public and that is no politics and mostly just pictures of my extremely cute cat so that is (laughs) my like i think in terms of agitation my instagram is the least agitated my twitter is fairly agitated because i retweet a lot of politics and then my facebook is like raw molly and so like if that's (laughs) what you want like Send me a request, but just so you know, it can, it's 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 not the place that I'm the most restrained because it is it is private. So, yeah. and you have a website as well. I do have a website, but I never update it, so I always forget about it. But yes, MollyTanzer.com is my website. It is often fairly accurate, although it is. I, I think it still has creatures of want and ruin as forthcoming. Oh no! Oh okay. Oh, that's dreadful. I'll, I'll spend some time with it soon. I. I, many things have, have gone by the wayside as I've tried to uh, cur- cur- turn in this book with a level of perfectionism that I don't know why I expect it from myself in what's basically a first draft. So we shall see. Well, I'll include all of these links in the show notes, along with links to the many, many books we've discussed uh, in the conversation. And thank, thank you so you. much for sharing your time with the Lesbian Historic Motif podcast. Thank you so much for having me on. It was such a thrill to get the invite. It was like, ooh, yay. It's my brand. (laughs) (laughs) Great. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Lesbian Historic Motif podcast. See the show notes for links to people and topics. Most shows will have a transcript linked as well. If you have a book announcement, a topic suggestion, or might like to appear on the show, please drop me an email. If you enjoyed this podcast, please rate it and subscribe on your favorite podcast app, and consider supporting our Patreon 